Our fact for this episode, getting on top and staying on top of your energy procurement does not have to feel like you're wading through treacle. So let's get into why. Welcome back to the Corporate Sustainability Education Channel. We're powered by the Southern Sustainability Partnership. In this episode, we aim to tackle the complex issue of energy procurement, and to do so, we're absolutely delighted to be joined by Chris Jermy, who is Head of Business Development at a leading energy management company, Zenergy, which is Z-E-N-E-R-G-I. Now, Zenergy is a customer service company. They specialise in energy and with the belief there is a better way forward for the energy industry. Fantastic. Their long term vision is quite simply to set organisations free, whether that means free from the stresses of managing their energy bills or being free from energy waste or as far as even taking them entirely off the grid helping them to manage the implementation of this and generating their own energy supply. So I think it's safe to say that Zenergy offers quite a comprehensive offering to their customers and one that's designed around them as a customer rather than a one size fits all. So Chris, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Linda. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be part of this. Thank you. Uh, Chris, firstly, um, I'd like to ask you if you could explain Zenergy's role in the energy management marketplace and then specifically in energy procurement. Sure. Yeah, we're, we're very fortunate here at Zenergy that we have such a breadth to the business. Um, so ultimately, we, we brand ourselves as a customer service company. Uh, we specialise in energy. That, that's the fundamental core to everything we do. Um, we're uh, regarded as a consultancy when it comes to uh, the breadth of different services. You could also brand us as a broker, a TPI, third party intermediary. Um, and that would generally be more of the procurement function to the business and also that sort of support service, which ultimately helps to uh, relinquish all of the stress and the hassle away from dealing with energy suppliers, so electricity, gas and also water as well nowadays. So um, in terms of our st sort of standard offering within the, the brokerage uh, sort of side of the business, um, we do an awful lot in terms of dedicated account management provision. Um, so it's not just about procuring the right contract for, for us. It's very much more about holding your hand, making sure that we're um, checking the invoices, dealing with any queries, getting to know your site inside and out, understanding what meter we're expecting, what consumption on, um, and, and really so you delegating that responsibility for, for managing your energy to your dedicated account manager. So, yeah, it, it's very much a, a, a one stop shop. Uh, and then I see it as a, as a really sort of complementary thing that we can actually do everything else in house as well to do with energy. So uh, that's where things such as uh, low carbon design. We've got uh, accredited chartered engineers that, that can do feasibility studies, design your your future biomass uh, boiler project, look at your LED lighting, um, solar PV, you know, we've, we've got the whole array covered. Um, <laughs> that was a good pun, wasn't it? Uh, and then beyond that, uh, we also do things like compliance as well. So, um, you know, things like the, the DEC, display energy certificates, um, energy performance certificates, uh, and the air conditioning inspections as well that are also required now. So. Pretty much anything energy, uh, you know, come to us and, and we'll try and take that stress and the hassle away from it. And, uh, you know, we're the consultants to help you. We're not some sort of pushy brokerage, which uh, I think sometimes people within the industry get sort of tired with that image in a way. I think you said the magic word, stress and the hassle. If you can take that away, then uh, then that's that's obviously a great thing, especially with energy procurement. So obviously you have options as to the energy companies that you choose to work with and why. And I think obviously mm. you'll have done a lot of research. So who you've decided to work with is, is obviously uh, very important to, to sort of explain to us really and why. Yeah, so uh, I personally actually managed the supplier relationships at, at one point a couple of years ago um, within my sort of journey throughout Zenergy. And uh, it's a role that I, I love doing, to be honest, because you know, we see managing suppliers as much more of a partnership uh, and it's unbelievable how you find that, that it's a roller coaster riding with suppliers within the industry you know 
nowadays they're not making the money that they used to uh, because of you know, the domestic side of the business and the, the sort of tariff levies that, um, that have sort of been now invoked by, by Ofgem. Um, and, uh, you know, they're trying to make efficiencies and, and cut costs in, in various different ways. And I think even when they were making money, the service wasn't exactly the best thing in the world. Um, and now we're finding that there's even more gaps that, that need to be sort of smoothed over. And uh, in terms of how we um, bring them on, we have a very rigorous um, sort of specification that, that effectively that they have to follow. It's quite funny when I used to send it to any new supplier that we're trying to engage with that, you know, they weren't used to having to fill that sort of thing in. Normally, uh, you know, consultants would say, yeah, we really want to work with you. And um, give us some prices, please, and we'll see what they look like. But uh, for us, there was minimum standards. There's about 35 things that, that you know, the supplier needed to adhere to. And we also run frameworks for, for um, sort of various different organizations as well. And we've taken a lot and learned a lot from working with those frameworks and the specifications that we have within those and making sure that that, that sort of standard is, is um, sort of passed across into to all of the suppliers. So um, yeah, we're fortunate enough to work with uh, around 15 suppliers, you know, some weird, it's still in sort of testing phase with, but if you name them, you know, we, we generally do work with them to some level. Um, and we find that our role is very much around presenting all of the options to you, but giving you as a customer the choice uh, and the understanding behind why we recommend a certain supplier over another, uh, because obviously it's not all just about price. Um, there's so many factors that come into to choosing the right supplier. And obviously we're here to help cushion the uh, any kind of problems that might arise in an account, but there is obviously only so much you can do with some suppliers that, that are really not um, behaving in the way that they should. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a good challenge. And, and it's one that we, as I say, we take very seriously. We meet with all of our suppliers on a quarterly basis. Um, and uh, we have a designated person that, that presents to the suppliers and, and builds those relationships. And I think we're very lucky that you know, even sort of 10 years ago, when I, I first sort of joined the business, we were always regarded as one of the top consultancies, you know, to work with. And, um, you know, su suppliers really took notice of us. And, and it's the same now, um, uh, you know, we're regarded very highly. And therefore, we can leverage uh, our sort of buying power, I suppose, to make sure that, that if there is an escalation issue or something that we need to get done, uh, you know, we can we can often sort of achieve that. Yeah, it sounds like you get these companies to really sharpen their pencil when it comes to uh, what they offer. And so you've done, you know, so much of the job that, uh, you know, other organisations out there just wouldn't have the ability to be able to get that level of uh, knowledge from these companies. So that sounds great. Um, in our work in corporate sustainability, obviously, we're always nudging people um, in the direction of the companies that offer um energy from you know from uh, re renewable sources say uh, wind or solar uh, every time more or less is the same answer that we get you know well that's going to cost us more so we're not interested really in looking at that um, is that still the case today or is you know is is it is it true that it does always cost more mm, uh, it, it depends on what your uh, classification for sustainable uh, energy really is I guess um, you know, there are options out there at the moment within the marketplace that you can get zero carbon energy that's effectively sourced via nuclear. Um, I say it's zero carbon, so some people tick that box. Uh, however, there'll be other people within the environmental sort of industries that no doubt will say, well, actually, uh, nuclear ne isn't necessarily a sustainable option for various other reasons. Um, but in terms of uh, the sort of traditional renewable tariffs, so what you mentioned there, the, the wind and the uh, solar PV sort of generated electricity, um, there really isn't much of an uplift on that at all. Uh, generally, it's uh, within 1%, it's less than 1% of, of sort of an annual spend on an electricity supply. So I must admit, we've seen a massive turn towards that within the sort of various industries that we work with. Um, it's been a real uptake where we, we present both options and uh, often it's, it's almost a little bit of a no-brainer for that sort of corporate responsibility side of things um, where companies are wanting to, to be able to wave that flag that they've, they've got a fully renewable tariff and you know, obviously they can then have the certification and things that back that up um, as well and they present that in their, their front office or front reception desks and uh, you know really really wave that flag uh, you know, well. So 
no, it, it really isn't uh, an expensive add-on nowadays. Um, you know, I think it's about 75% of the, the energy that we generate now within the UK roughly is renewable. So it, it's not a massive add-on um, generally. It's a you know, really positive um, change within the industry that I've witnessed since I've been in it, where uh, you know, most of what we used to have was sourced from coal and, and gas. But yeah, uh, it's, it's incredible how much of our generation now is coming from mainly wind, but also the odd bit of solar. And uh, obviously there's hydro and other sources as well. That's something to be very proud of. I hadn't realised that we were quite at that percentage level. So I, I, that, that's just amazing. Uh, in many cases, it always surprises me, really. The energy bill is the first time a company sees its usage since the last bill. I understand that, though. I mean, obviously, they've got the day job. But no matter the size of the organisation, this is a large expenditure because it's relative, isn't it, to the revenue that they bring into the business. Um, and it's largely uncontrolled by a lot of businesses, um, and which would be an unacceptable expense in other aspects of the business. Um, you know, this is a slightly uncontrolled or unknown by the top level people in the company, if you like, how much they actually spend. So how would you propose that a company takes control of this so that people higher up in the business actually are aware of, of these costs? Yeah, it's an interesting one that, isn't it? Um, you know, there's a whole different variety of different periods that people can invoice for, for energy and water as well. Water's, you know, potentially like six months, you know, what can happen in terms of leaks in between the start and the end of that. Um, but uh, energy, generally, we only deal with monthly invoicing. Um, so it's fair to say that it's, it, it's rare that too much can get out of sync within a month's period. Uh, and you can track the energy consumption fairly well from, you know, on that period as well. So generally monthly invoicing allows for enough of a level of, of sort of monitoring and, and understanding of what, what's going on. Um, however, certainly where the, 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 the spend on a supply starts to creep up, um, you know, it, where you're spending £100,000 on energy plus, I would suggest that actually it's probably worth looking at some sort of uh, automatic metering um, whereby you can see on your gas usage and uh, your electricity usage exactly what's being used and when. Um, and, and obviously like we specialise in auditing as well and going into factories or, or whatever that might be and, and understanding what the peaks and the troughs are and, and helping to reduce those, those elements. But um, it's uh, in terms of the, the sort of the day-to-day -day usage, it's nice if you can have some kind of day-to-day -day report that's automatically generated off the back of this, uh, this type of metering that you can pay a little bit extra to have. Um, and it helps you observe when, you know, things like the boiler systems have been switched on or, uh, you know, the factory is ended its day or the IT uh, infrastructure has been shut down. You know, you, you can observe all these sorts of trends. And actually as well, there's this special sort of alerts and things that can be set up uh, within those types of systems that, you know, actually you get a text message or, um, you know, another email that says something's been exceeded. Um, so it really does help you get fully on top of what's going on within, within your organisation. Um, as I say, it, it, the investment of cost within that it generally uh, means that you need to be very in touch with it. You need to uh, be wanting to find out these sorts of things. There's no good paying out a load of money for a load of advanced metering and software technology when no one's really appointed or designated to, to uh, observe it and understand it and do something about it. So, uh, you know, it's something that I'm quite passionate about, but likewise, you need to, to make sure that, that you've got someone there to, to actually hone in and, and drill into that sort of information. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, in an idea world, if there is ever such a thing as an idea world, who would Zenergy like to actually be seeing this data? Um, it's interesting because I mean we deal with a massive range of, of clientele. So we've got you know Formula One companies that we work with on procurement, all the way uh, sort of across to uh, primary schools and nursery schools. You know, um, in the education space, we do actually look after uh, around three thousand schools and colleges, and it, it's lovely where um, you know obviously in terms of facilities managers, it's nice that that they get to see what what the usage is doing, and, and therefore they can troubleshoot things. Um, you know, I always personally have recommended that, that site managers, facility staff take meter readings on at least a monthly basis. 
they don't just take the meter reading, they actually acknowledge to say whether the difference in the usage is, is reasonable or not based on what they think should have happened within the building. Um, so it sort of goes that next step to say, well, actually, yeah, I am authorised and I am the, the sign offer to say that that usage is reasonable. And then I pass that over to the suppliers to back up the invoicing. Um, but just in terms of just going back to the educational side of it, um, it's really great that actually a lot of the data that we present on our portal. So as part of our procurement service as a portal, um, people can very easily go on um, with the multiple users can, can uh, access the information, look at all of the trends. They can dial into you know, a, a sports pavilion meter, for instance, uh, and, and see exactly what the trends have been export that to uh, an Excel database and then use it within their lessons to then, you know, do things like maths or geography or, or, or science. Uh, it supports various different parts of the curriculum. So um, we've seen that quite a lot within uh, a lot of our schools that we work with. Um, and I, I guess this is kind of a bit of a, um, a sort of name drop towards our climate crisis game as well that we have where people can actually log on to a game and make uh, basically political decisions on, on what they think is the best thing to do first and, and where to spend money on, on making the uh, uh, a very small kind of town uh, more more sustainable so yeah it's quite a fun game as well <laughs> really about joined up thinking isn't it it's each individual department area of a, of whatever it is whether it's a school or a factory or an office you know really it's looking having everybody accountable as to their areas and what's actually being used and to be able to see mm -hmm. that data you know and and sort of look where the where there might be areas that need to be addressed and i think the higher up the chain that could be seeing that might be a horror story then maybe things would happen um but uh, yeah it, it is complex and i think that uh, there's so, but there's so much money that can be saved just by taking time out to really look at this seriously so let's drill down now into the energy bill itself and ask you what are the key points to look for in the billing when you receive your bill from the company because we speak to a lot of companies who find that process in itself can be quite complicated yes yes absolutely um it, it's interesting as well i've got accountancy friends that also have invoices uh, and you know very clever people that actually don't have a clue what half of the, the different terminologies used on these invoices are nowadays uh it depends on the kind of product that you go for but they can be uh you know i've seen some that are seven pages long uh you know with 15 to 20 different lines of different charges on them so you know they, they can be very complex but um i would always start with the supply mpan or mpr so the meter point administration number or meter point reference number just make sure it's your meter effectively so everyone has a supply or barcode effectively uh for the pipe or the cable coming in um and you'll be surprised how many people actually pay i guess this kind of happens more so in some of the sort of the school market and uh where local authority type contracts things get muddled up sometimes but uh, it's remarkable how many people pay their invoices for the wrong uh, meters sometimes. Um, and, and sometimes as well, it, it's uh, just a case that a meter has been updated and some the, the engineer that's, that's done that updating of the meter hasn't reflected that back on the industry. So, um, you know, we find that the old meters still carry on being billed uh, that then need to be rectified. Um, uh, generally, it's surprising every time I attend a site with their, their invoices before they sort of come over to us, I generally find at least one thing wrong. Um, it might be something like the VAT being incorrect. Um, you know, a, a real sort of heads up to people, I suppose, is uh, for charities, anyone with residential domestic usage, um, a lot of various different types of schools that are perceived as um, charities. They uh, shouldn't be paying VAT at the full rate, which then means they shouldn't be paying the uh, business energy tax of climate change levy. Um, uh, yeah, it's incredible how many um, organisations you see that are on the incorrect charges for that. Um, and also there's industrial um, discounts as well for, for factories uh, that can also get the climate change levy discounts. And that's a, a between a five to sort of 20% impact of, of sort of budget cost that, you know, if you get it wrong. So, um, you know, well worth just making sure. And that's not the VAT side of it at all. That's purely just the, the climate change levy element. So well worth getting that correct. I think we're all seeing um, sort of capacity charges and excess capacity charges nowadays as well for those that are on half hourly electricity metering. Um, so it, it's important to, to look at that and just make sure that you're 
your agreed network capacity that you have there is not too high, which so therefore you're paying a premium to have something you just don't need. Um, but also that you're not paying a lot of excess charges if you're you're set too low. Um, and a really sort of key thing to that as well is often brokers will say, well, you need to up your connection agreement to then um, be able to uh, not pay the excess charges. But actually, you know, that can cost 30, 40,000 pounds to get a new transformer upgrade or, you know, cable upgrades and, and all the other stuff. And actually just think a bit more laterally about where you could spend that money and actually reduce your capacity down, i.e. LED lighting, solar PV, you know, reduce your demand from the grid. Uh, and that way you're putting good money, a, a, a good project and then moving you on that sort of journey to, to low carbon. So, um, yeah, I've probably not touched on uh, at least 10 other things that you can have a look for on, on energy invoices. Obviously, you've got things like estimated billing, um, all that sort of thing. Uh, that, that obviously we would check if, if you're a customer of ours, it would uh, it all flag up in our system. Yes, I think it it's all about red flags that you're looking for, really. I mean, yes, obviously you want to make sure that you put them in the right place to get the best um, for their money in terms of their their energy, but also you're looking for red flags which they're probably not aware of. And as you've just highlighted that in several of them already and there's more out there you can understand why people are quite relieved when you walk through the door to be honest mm. with you um you touched on the 30 minute metering system i've heard a lot of organizations talk about that can you tell us if there are any benefits to that and if an organization that's listening or watching us now doesn't have a 30 minute meter can they request one is that possible uh, yeah, so so most pe people have 30 minutes, a half hourly electricity metering. Um, and that's because legislation made them effectively. Um, so it was a, an off-gem initiative uh, many, many years ago, I think before, way before I came in the industry, um, sort of probably about 20 years ago now, whereby um, large consumers had to have half hourly metering. And the real... in in sort of intrinsic benefit of that is whereby the grid can uh, up the generation in accordance to when they can see what the trends are doing and, and see what the consumer's demand is doing. Now, you can imagine the opposite of that. If we didn't all have half hourly meters and, and we were all just build on a monthly basis without any tracking of, of sort of day to day and, and time of use, the generators would be completely blind to, as to say, well, who's generating what and when. So. The fact that we've got this great data that's all settled on um, you know, behind the scenes allows the generators to see what the peaks and the troughs are doing and uh, basically means that these um, power stations aren't on when they don't need to be on, um, which therefore helps to reduce the overall cost um, you know, to, to us as a consumer. Now, we had uh, a scheme, I think it was 2017 in April, P272, another off-gem initiative where it sort of brought in other half-hourly um, meters from the non half hourly segment, it sort of sucked them into the half hourly metering uh, requirement. Um, and that kind of included sort of smaller organizations. Uh, and often we get asked the question well, this meter is costing me 250, 300 pounds a year just to have this meter. Uh, plus, now you're charging me for data collection. And I never used to see these charges you know, within my non half hourly contract. And you know, when someone's only spending sort of £10,000 a year on electricity, you know, that, that chunk of five, six hundred, seven hundred pounds is, is quite a, an extra add on. So for a lot of organisations, it's something that you wouldn't necessarily want to, to have installed. Um, again, if you feel like there's a benefit and you've got someone there that's really keen on observing the trends and, and using that half hourly data, then it's a good investment to make because you'll probably get that back. Um, but a lot of organisations don't actively try and get half hourly metering just purely because of the added budget cost there. Um, and it's sort of hard to see that, that benefit. Also, uh, there would be other considerations as well if you had a non half hourly meter at the moment to switch to half hourly, um, that would require a change in measurement class and the whole process that you'd have to go through. Um, as well as probably supply upgrades uh, and all the other necessary upgrades that you then need to have uh, on your internal sort of electric electrical infrastructure. Um, so, so generally isn't something you would opt to do, I, I would suggest. 
uh, as I said, there is the option that you can have a non-half hourly meter and have uh, half hourly data uh, on a sort of data logger uh, fitted to the supplies. Uh, and you can get all those, those benefits if you are still interested in uh, observing those trends. Okay, so when an organisation decides that they're going to contact um, Zenergy, could you tell us how they should prepare for the meeting? Yeah, that's, that's really straightforward. Um, so we try and take all of the hassle away um, from that entire process. So literally all we generally require is a recent copy invoice um, for each of the meters. So that would be electricity, gas and water if you want to look at the water. Um, and we'd need a letter of authority. Uh, everything is completely no obligation. Uh, you'll be pleased to hear we're not one of those sort of pushy consultancies that will be bombarding you on the phone every day until you until you sign a deal. Um, we very much like to, to build a strategy and, and work with you on, on what works and give you, you know, the proper advice that means that you're going to come back to us and stay with us for, for years. Um, I mean, it, it's often nice to know some things. So, you know, there is to, to be able to provide exactly what you want. You know, we need to ask some questions. Um, and, and obviously, one of those questions would be around green electricity and whether you would want, you know, a, a renewable um, generation certificate and all those sorts of things. And also to go through the types of products that are on offer. So, um, you know, specifically on procurement here, um, you know, things like uh, fixed contracts, whether flexible contracts are the right for you, whether a pass through contract would be uh, more appropriate um, and, and how much risk and budgetary sort of certainty you require as an organization. Um, and then also obviously how long you like to opt into a contract for and, and, and all that sort of side of it. Um, but, uh, you know, to kick the things off, it, as I say, it's very simple, just a recent copy bill per metre and then the authorisation. OK, um, Chris, could we, in brief, um, as I know that could be a long conversation, but could we look at a particular <laughs> case study, not mentioning a customer name, but just a little yep. sort of case study? You know, they contacted us because of this. We did this and this was the outcome. Yeah, sure. So um, we work an awful lot through customer referrals, we're, we're not a hard hitting telephone, you know, campaign -y kind of organization. Um, and uh, it, it's great that, you know, we hang our hats on how great our service is and, and the word spreads very quickly throughout various different, you know, industries. Uh, and this is a sort of prime example of one actually that I, I've personally been working on. And we've got some loads of, you know, really nice case studies that are really flashy organizations, but this one's a little bit more sort of bread and butter, I suppose. So. Um, property management company uh, working in and around London, uh, spend is around three quarters of a million, uh, increasing quite rapidly where uh, they're developing lots of different buildings. Uh, it's quite an interesting portfolio because you have you know, builders involved, you have change of tenancies, you have lots of disconnections, you have lots of new connections. Um, you know, it, it, it's very easy for a portfolio like that to kind of get out of kilter and, uh, and uh, you know, for bills to start rocking up that you're not expecting. So, um, so we, uh, it was a customer referral where um, someone said how great we were that they used to work with uh, previous employers and they recommended to the head of facilities to, to speak to us. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we procured fully renewable contracts for them. Uh, I negotiated a back date um, of, I think it was around 50,000 uh, pounds where they'd gone out of contract with their uh, supplier. Um, and I think the, the really sort of key thing about it all for me is we meet with them every three weeks um, uh, and it'd be so easy to, to sort of secure a contract and, and then, you know, wave goodbye, which, you know, a lot of consultants would do. But um, I think we're probably on about the 10th meeting now um, where we're still resolving issues because, they're, you know, they're, as I say, the portfolio is constantly evolving. Um, and uh, we've got an awful lot of, you know, this is interesting, actually half hourly meters um, whereby the um, actual meter itself, it, the connection's been lost on, on it's about five or six of them. We're, the account manager's working to overcome all those issues with the, the meter operators and the data collectors, and that's requiring um, sort of different types of, of uh, telephone links um, and sort of costs for the customer that, you know, they have to invest. But when they've got £100,000 of usage going through a supply, you know, a few hundred quid to invest is something that, you know, they probably should have done a few years ago. So, you know, it's, it's a really interesting portfolio that we're, we're kind of coming to the end of, of resolving all those issues now. And, uh, you know, it, it should be fairly plain sailing, you know, but obviously with the, the added development work that, that we're still doing for them. 
um, you know, and I think testament to, to how well we're doing with them is, you know, they're inviting us to their uh, sustainability events that they they operate, they, they hold sustainability as a really key um, motivator for them, a key objective for them is to become zero carbon. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm hoping that our design team can also support them with all of the projects, um, you know, in the near future, uh, now that we're sort of fully on board and uh, proving our, our value to them. And thank you, Chris. That, yeah, that was useful. So that was our last question. A uh, big thank you to Chris Jeremy, Head of Business Development at Zenergy, for your really valuable insights into energy management and procurement. I think it's clear to see what can be achieved when you engage with a company like Zenergy. You'll be pleased to know that we have asked them to join us again. There's a lot more that they have to share with us. You'll find a link to the Zenergy website to the right of this video. If you can find out more about what the company provides and their contact details. And in the meantime, thank you for watching or thank you for listening and we'll see you in the next one.